Before I read this lesson this morning from Revelation, let's um, talk a little bit about Revelation because you're going to be dealing with it for the next maybe six uh, Wednesdays. It's going to be in our lectionary, Sunday lectionary for uh, all the way until Pentecost. And so let's just set up Revelation a little bit before we get started with our first reading today. You know, it's the, the Revelation uh, to John, also called the Apocalypse of John. It is an apocalypse. What is an apocalypse? Well, an apocalypse is, a, is an unveiling or a revealing. And so, um, you know, the, the modern term for apocalypse now is some kind of a disaster, but that's not what the word really means. It's an unveiling. And so when we read Revelation, we need to realize that this is uh, an unveiling to, to John. What, what does that mean? Well, the ancients had a real sense of what the heavenly realm, wh where it was. It wasn't up in the sky somewhere. The heavenly realm was right there among them. And so it was like the veil is lifted and now John can see into the heavenly realm and Revelation is John trying to describe something that is indescribable. <laughs> and you can imagine what that must be like. And so uh, John is trying to describe that, but he's also trying to give strength to the seven churches that are on the eastern part of what we now call, I mean the western part of what we now call Turkey. Ephesus being one of those. Um, there's a great persecution going on, probably by Nero. Um, and he's trying to give strength to these churches to give them hope and courage because he's fighting against one of the, the fastest growing religions in, that, in the world right now. He's fighting against the religion of the worship of the emperor. And so th this is what he's up against. And so you'll hear, hear John talk about uh, the beast, which is the emperor. You'll hear him talk about Babylon, which is Rome. So th you'll hear all of these coded languages when we move through these in the next few weeks. So be prepared for that. But it's, uh, this is the introduction, what we'll read today. So I need uh, one of you to be prepared to read after I finish reading this opening sentence, op opening uh, section of verses from Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be the kingdom, be a kingdom, priest serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The word of the Lord. Who could read it for us now? Thank you, Karen. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priest serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, 
He is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Thank you. Now, it was, what's that? Well, I have the microphone. I'll go ahead and just say, what are the seven spirits in the second line? Oh, the seven spirits. Are those uh, the seven churches? The, no. the seven spirits um, are angels. If we look at, uh, I think it's in Tobit, it talks about the seven angels that stand around the throne. Um, and so uh, that, that's what I have uh, found in my research. But um, who was, wants to, to uh, summarize what we've heard? Oh, come on. It's so easy. <laughs> come on, somebody be brave and see if they can do it. There we go. That's my man. Well, to a large extent, it's, it's a general greeting, but it's grace and peace to you from God, who is, was, and will be forever, kind of reminiscent of, of what we just said in the glory be to the Father, uh, and from Jesus Christ, the firstborn of the dead. We've already talked about that in terms of, of the first fruits of the resurrection. And uh, again, referring to Christ, to him who loves us and freed us from sin and death by his sacrifice, uh, that we now become part of him, priest, prophet, and king. Um, and then we have, you know, he's, he's coming from with the clouds uh, and he will be revealed to the world, even to the Gentiles, even to those who are persecuting uh, his people. Yes, that's right. Uh, and they're going to be really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's a real, uh, a real hopeful part there for people. Who and then be, back, yeah. God says, yeah. I am the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, the Omega who is, was, and ever shall be. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Now, what did, did anything in this passage capture your attention? What in this passage captured your attention? Barbara? Well, I thought it was a real gutsy statement because it seems real political when he says he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and so you can imagine all the persecution, and then today, the same thing. Yeah. Um, and then they set it up so that, um, and made us to be a kingdom, priest serving as God and Father to be glory and dominion forever and ever. So that in your face kind of confrontation with the political powers of oppression. Yeah. Again, so, giving so much hope to those who are under persecution, right? right? Yeah. Good. Thank you, Barbara. Who else? Anybody else have anything to, that captured your attention? Because there's a bunch of stuff in here. Well, this, this probably isn't too profound, but to me something that, that kind of stood out was the separation of Jesus from God the Father. Uh, we're so used to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, but this is... This is much more separate than that. But of course, this was written 200 plus years before the, the Apostles' Creed and the, and the Nicene Creed yeah. kind of codified our understanding of the, of the Trinity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that, that's where early, early days, what, what is this, uh, uh, the last third of the, of the first century, something like that? Yeah, this is somewhere, well, probably. Uh, before the destruction of the temple, somewhere in there. So this is, you know, 65, I read 70. one place that, that maybe as late as 95. Well, that's, yeah, could have been, 
completed then, maybe started before that, but yeah, hard to tell. But early, yeah, definitely early. Anybody else have anything that really struck them? It's interesting. I, um, I like the way that this is coupled with the gospel from Sunday. So we have the Thomas, doubting Thomas, or normal Thomas as I call him, um, uh, <laughs> seeing Jesus and exclaiming, you know, my Lord, my God. And then we have this, this, uh, this revelation that Jesus is going to come back and those who uh, he will be revealed and we will know him, we'll see him, you know. And, and so there's this neat... Um, I think this neat uh, synchronicity with those mm -hmm. two mm -hmm. passages. Um, and what I love about it is that um, when, when Thomas sees Jesus, he's welcomed in and loved. He's not, he's not ostracized. And, and so I find great hope in what um, Revelation to John is, is saying to us, is that we're going to be ushered in also in yeah. the second coming. Yeah, great. Thank you. Anybody else? What about, what, what did you like about this passage? What did you like about it? I think Justin spoke a little bit about that. What, what, what else? Anybody else have any thoughts about what they liked about it? Gail? Gail? Is that I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. So no matter what happens, God is on either end of everything. So I think that things will work out. Yeah, yeah. No matter what earthly power thinks they're in charge, God says, nope, I'm it. <laughs> Anybody else have anything that spoke to them that they really liked about the passage? No one will be surprised by me saying this, but um, I love the fact that, okay, so John is praying in the spirit on the Lord's day. That's how it starts off. And it's revealed to him, uh, Christ in now in all his, in his majesty. Uh, and, it's, and, it's, and as the scripture goes on, it's even intensified. And so your attention is on the exalted Christ, but then uh, then, then it's made clear that we are the kingdom of priests who are to serve him. Yes. And so we didn't get a B-team job. We got the A-level job. And so our work um, is to be this kingdom of priests representing the exalted one. And I find that to be extremely hopeful. Um, and... Uh, you know, as, I, it, it, as we prepare for confirmation, if I could just get anything into the heads of the adults and children being confirmed, don't you realize this is, like, this is just like your knighthood. You're being made. You're being brought into this, into this select kingdom of priests to serve the, the Almighty One, or as Gail said, the one who's the beginning and the end. Yeah. Is there anything in this passage? Oh, yeah, come on, Scott. I really like what, what Gail said, and it, it catches you. It says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, right? So we know who he is. He's the Lord God. And then it keeps on going, who is and who was and who is to come. And then it says the Almighty. It's like, okay, we know you're the Lord God. And then it, re it intensifies it and says the Almighty. And, uh, and it's talking about Christ here. I mean, it, it's pretty, it sounds pretty specific that they're calling him. He is the Lord God, yeah. the Almighty. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything in this passage uh, that bothered you? Anything in the passage that bothered you? Mm -hmm. 
Amy, you look like you want to say something. <laughs> well, it was the very first part. When, um, when he's saying grace to you and peace from him who is and was and, and who is to come, and you think, oh, he's talking about Jesus. And then he says later on, and from Jesus. So it's like what Ed said about before the real understanding of the Trinity, yeah. uh, there was a separation. That, that bothered me. But that's already been said, so. Yeah. Anyway. Anybody else have any thoughts about anything that bothered them in this passage? Well, at first it bothered me, on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. And I thought, well, gee. And then I started thinking that I like to think of uh, God as a universalist, that everybody's going to heaven. <laughs> and so the tribes of the earth, it could be every sect of the, <laughs> the Christian church. It could be uh, Muslims. It could be Jews. It could be everybody. And they're wailing. But then I think... That God dries every tear. So but that bothered me. I wondered if wailing always means negative. I wonder if. Well, wouldn't they have used another verb like cheering? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't yeah. Know. Anyway, that's good. Okay, anybody else have anything bothering them in this passage? That's mm, good. What does this passage tell us about God? I think it says a lot about God. Anybody want to tell us what it says, what you can pick out of it? Come on. <laughs> I mean, it's, he's in, God is infinite. He, he says it always was, always will be, uh, the creator, the almighty. Uh, personally, I don't find anything that bothers me in this chapter, in this ver verse. I find it more uplifting and, and anticipatory. Mm -hmm. uh, like, yeah. yeah, this is the main guy. Uh, and, you know, he are in charge. And I need to pay real close attention. <laughs> so that's... That's all that I have. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're right about paying close attention. I mean, this is the beginning of the revelation, so pay attention. <laughs> More it, to come. It really, it really, to me, it, it feels a lot like uh, the prelude in John in the gospel. Yeah, 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 good, good. Amy. Okay, it, <laughs> yeah, uh, it says in the question, tell us about God and tell us about ourselves. Okay, it's scary. <laughs> it's scary because you're talking about God the Almighty. And I think about my daily prayers, my little prayers, and I'm thinking sometimes I'm, I'm just kind of flip about it. You know, I'm just sort of, eh. Okay, pray to God. Okay, thanks, God. You know, please help this person. You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And when you think you're, <laughs> you're praying to the Almighty, I mean, we should just be flat out, yeah. you know. Spread eagle on the floor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, anyway, so yeah. that tells us about God and about us. Anyway. He loves us anyway, so that's the good. That's the good news. Thank you. I really like the uh, first grace to you and peace. But he talks about who he is, right? He he gives his credentials in that first bit. Okay, he's he, he is he isn't the I mean he is the humble Jesus and God that was here on earth, but now he's God. And so it starts by, you know, really glorifying. He has seven spirits before his throne. And uh, 
He's a faithful witness, which I think how many people would love to have someone that actually told the truth about them and supported them and uh, is a faithful witness for them. He's the firstborn of the dead, so that's our claim to God is that he has died for us. Mm -hmm. And so um, he's that firstborn, our hope, and he's the ruler of all the kings. So we don't have to worry about these rulers on earth. We've got the ultimate ruler, yeah. and he has won the battle. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Tells us about God and tells us about us. That's right. Anybody else have anything? Yeah, Barbara. I, th I think this passage is hopeful, uh, you know, that it is the kingdom that we're talking about. What makes me unhappy is what we have done with the rest of this book, that it gets so crazy and uh, off this theme at all. Mm -hmm. well, we'll find out about that as we move through this. Justin? The uh, Young Men's Bible Studies looked at this same passage this week, and so I did a little research, and the, the number seven is a number of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And so, to me, by the, the apoptic, apocalyptic literature that this is, of using the number seven isn't really um, uh, specific as much as it is um, revealing the fulfillment that God has in our lives and the fulfillment of all promises and, and that, that God is the Almighty. And the, the seven spirits are wisdom, understanding, peace, humility, um, they could be the seven angels, but they also might, scholars believe it might be the, the nature of God being fulfilled in the almighty mm -hmm. God, the creator um, that was revealed to us in Jesus. And so, um, so when you begin to think about who God is, you, you can really, when we trust in God, we are going, we too are going to be totally fulfilled. Um, not, not in a um, human uh, understanding of fulfillment, um, but in a divine way, like, I, yeah. you know, just uh, s saved from our sins, freed, have peace, joy, you know, all those things that we, we strive for, but God will make those things happen. Wonderful. Great. What does this passage tell us about living to please God? What does this passage tell us about living to please God? God. Anybody have some thoughts? How can we please God? What does this passage help us understand about that? If, if we take what you said at the beginning, um, that the kingdom is right in front of us, then um, we are to be uh, seeking that veil to be lifted in our own lives so that we can see the kingdom now, not, not wait for a future time for that to take place. And so how can we trust that God is unveiling the kingdom um, as we speak? Th this might be the kingdom of God right here in this place. Um, having this conversation and, and thinking and worshiping God. Um, um, it's not preparing us for something to come. It is here and now. Um, when we come up to the altar today and receive Eucharist, mm -hmm. we, are, we are in the kingdom. We're in that you moment. It's you. been unveiled. That's right. um, yep. and so I think um, pleasing God is to actually re recognize that we are in it. And, and God wants us right here. And, and that should then also shape what we do with the rest of our time and the rest of our lives. Thank you, Justin. That's great. Anybody, Scott, you got something to share with us? I, th I thought about what, what you said about uh, in the context of, of revel revelation, right? This worship of the emperor, yeah. persecution going on, things like that. And um, when, he, when he's saying, 
peace, grace to you and peace from him, from, from the very God of the universe to a church that is being persecuted, to a church that is under the thumb of Rome. Yeah. Uh, and what it would be like to hear those words spoken to you and to the community uh, and, and to a God who, to a God like this, to him who loves you and freed you from your sins by his blood and to make you a kingdom, to make, make you a kingdom, this, this group a kingdom, priest serving God. I mean, that's got to be really shocking. Yeah, yeah uplifting, I would think. Uh, Karen. You know, I guess I just find it interesting, and it kind of takes off what Patrick was saying. It says, priest serving his God. It's not disciples. It's not a, it is yeah. priests. So it's kind of elevated, which means I think the demands are higher, if that's possible. You bet. Yeah. 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 To piggyback on what Justin was saying about the kingdom of God, the, the pastoral uh, theologian that I live with uh, uses the, the phrase, uh, the now and the not yet, to describe the kingdom of God. Yes, we're living in the kingdom of God today, but what this kind of thing is telling us to do is to, per, to make it better. Yeah. To, so we are responsible for making thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven already. Yeah. Good. Boy, it's perfectly, perfectly said. Now, since, uh, since we know God's word is true, what do we have to change in our lives to obey this passage of scripture? I want y'all to just think about that. What do we have to do to live the way God wants us to live, to obey this passage of scripture? And then number six, who do we know that might need to hear uh, what God has to, to say? So think about that, okay? All right, well, now let's, uh, let's affirm what we believe. <laughs>